I think it's terribly important to insist on individual values. Learning culture podcast. Initiative, creation, all these things which we value. It's now possible to make organizations on a larger scale than was ever possible before. Learning culture podcast. Teach people to analyze the kind of things that are said to them. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Learning Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Barry, and joining me this week is Mark Lassoff. Mark's the founder of Tech Learning Network, one of the leading video-based educational platforms around web development, mobile applications, programming, digital design, a lot of skills that companies going through digital transformations need more and more of. Mark's background in the space goes back to the OG level era. Mark has taught over 2 million students online in the skills that I mentioned before and was one of the first instructors on Udemy to make over a million dollars in royalties. This guy has been there and done it. And he's a bit of a rabble rouser too. So this was a, a fun, interesting, engaging conversation where we pushed some spiky points of view that I think you're going to enjoy. We spent a lot of time talking about video-based education and how... You don't necessarily need, although it's super helpful to have the Incredibles 2 studios that Mark and his team have built, but there, there are other ways to, to recreate and, and focus on high quality education and instruction through video means. But production value is always going to be important, especially as you scale. We discussed some of the digital skills I mentioned earlier and what tools and techniques people should be thinking more about to bring into their workplace. We look at the role traditional instructional design plays and how in its traditional form, it's probably just one part of a skill set that a learning team needs. And I talk a lot about learning culture offices and the teams they need to build. And we unpack that a little bit together, looking at the role of professionals that have media background, for example, and what role that can play in learning. We talk about the role story plays. And for those of you who've listened to the episode with Angus Fletcher, you'll know how powerful stories are. So Mark and I weave that into a discussion around how we can bring stories out in video-based formats and how to do that with subject matter experts who are not comfortable in front of a camera or even telling stories. And finally, we talk a little bit about Mark's lessons learned from his initial explorations on TikTok and how it might not be the platform itself that can change the way we teach companies, but perhaps there are lessons in engagement and capturing attention that TikTok has to teach us. So if you're looking for ideas and inspiration on how to make your learning more engaging, more effective, if you're looking for inspiration on what skills you should be thinking about as you start to build the skills architecture within your company, this conversation will give you a lot of great ideas. So please sit back and enjoy my conversation with Mark Lassoff. What's up, Mark? Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, likewise. Um, I think we've got we've got some some things in common here, and I, I want to start with um, with I want to start by stating the problem. Um, it 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 sort of let, well. Let me hear it from you. Traditional instructional design. I call it top down sort of creation of training by events just doesn't seem to work to me. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, so first of all, I'm not an instructional designer by training or trade. Um, but, you know, working in this industry, I've certainly become familiar with the instructional design process and how instructional design approaches solving training problems and, and you know, behavioral problems, attitude problems within the workplace. Um, and my essential attitude or, or problem with the way we currently practice is that 95% of what instructional designers are doing is not applying all the theory and the things they spend time learning in school, which are great to inform design, mm -hmm. but they're creating media. Right. And we are a media production arm. We are part of digital, but we use tools that shortcut the creation of digital, cut us, cut out the real power in producing digital content in order to provide access to people who are really ill-suited and not trained to do it. 
So I think really, you know, the problem is that instructional designers are treated as an island unto themselves. And really instructional design is two, maybe three different jobs. Mm -hmm. You have the educational aspects, managing the project, creating interactions, you know, culling down a table of contents that makes sense. Mm -hmm. transforming complex information into digestible information that people can learn. That does require, you know, someone with an education background or experience. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to creating the media, that's where you need people like me who've got a background in actually developing digital, whether that's from a coding standpoint or design standpoint. Mm -hmm. And you know, the sooner we realize those are two different jobs, the sooner we're going to create media that competes with the other media that people see every day. Yeah. And people, we're in a world where people are looking at media all day long. They're looking at podcasts like this one. They're looking at video, audio, YouTube, Netflix. And educational media seems to want like a special dispensation from being contemporary quality. And, and I don't think we get that in the eyes of the viewers. So yeah. everything looks like it's, you know, 1995 internet, you know, and it's kind of this slide based format a lot of the times. I'd yeah. say there are people doing excellent work out there. There are. Right. But I think we just we feel like a lot of the work is behind the eight ball. I don't know if you agree with that assessment. Yeah, but it's the the great work is super rare, and it's and it's often not even the fault of that person, right? It's because they are being asked to do all of these things, which they either don't have time for or they're not trained for. Um, I I totally agree with that. I think um, also for learning professionals who are sort of in charge of a department, starting to think about the types of roles you need. You need someone with that educational training, but you also, to your point, need someone with the the sort of digital experience, media experience to be able to, that's like the communication piece, right? To be able to like convey the message, which is obviously like, that's the whole point. Right. And I think we also, you know, there's a little bit of a battle for the soul of this industry and whether the the media or the educational people are, are going to, you know, eventually control the long-term, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of long-term future of, of what we're going to do here. And, you know, the edu the people with the educational background, obviously, you know, are, are very much needed and an important part of this. And I don't want to discount what they do. But at the same time, you know, oftentimes when we talk about this, I'm provided with, you know, 23 year old studies about, you know, visual design doesn't matter mm -hmm. from a, yeah. a completely different media era. You know, media has changed so much in the last 20 years. If we're going to depend on studies, we really need to do studies now that take the current media milieu into consideration versus, you know, pre pre YouTube. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally agree. Um, okay, so let's let's ground it in in the experience that you bring to this conversation. So you've taught over 2 million students online, you're one of the first on Udemy to do a million dollars in, in royalties. I, I want to start, let's go back to that point. So what, what got what I guess the question, the more interesting question is what's made you see the potential of a, a platform like Udemy? So I'm going to go back a little bit before that and rewind a little bit. I was working with uh, New Horizons, which used to be really the dominant uh, tech, tr like in a local tech training center franchise. They were There was hundreds of them all over the world uh -huh. uh, you know, teaching everything from Word to Cisco to... Uh, you know, the A plus, net plus, all of those basic tech skills. Mm -hmm. And in 2001, they started bringing their content online. And the, I, I was involved in that effort. The problem was 20 years ago, we didn't yet have enough bandwidth for video really to be a pleasant experience for most people. Right. So uh, I... From when I left New Horizons for a few years, I did uh, traditional tech training on uh, you know on the road, airplane every Monday and Friday, classroom four days a week. Yeah. You know, teaching at the time what were called rich internet applications, Flash, Flex, uh, right. Director, and and coding for those in ActionScript and, and, and JavaScript and basic web. So that was kind of my niche, and I was teaching in big companies all over the world. It was great. And I uh, was about to teach a course at the FAA in mm -hmm. Washington. It was a Monday mm -hmm. morning. I, I, I had felt not great the night before, and I was about to get up and teach. I almost passed out when I got up. Mm -hmm. Went to the hospital and found out I had colon cancer. I had been imperceptibly losing blood 
wow. for probably years. Um, it, it's something wow. that crept up. I mean, you know, you know like kind of like when the refrigerator stops running, that's when you realize it was on. Right. I'd be getting <laughs> becoming sick and weak so slowly. Yeah. But I didn't realize it was happening to me. Was that from the travel and the stress and sort of burnout? Who knows? I mean, you know, mm. it, it was it was from a you know a, a giant uh, tumor in my colon. I mean, yeah. who knows what the genesis of it was? Right, right. That's um, crazy. So I, you know, had surgery, had a colon resection about twelve years ago, and then you know, as I'm recovering and going through a round of chemotherapy, I couldn't travel, so I couldn't resume my old, you know, my old job. Right. But I wasn't so sick that I was incapacitated. So, uh, you know, you can only watch so much Price is Right. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time just kind of aimlessly surfing the web. And I discovered Udemy, which at the time was mm. tiny and terrible. Mm. And you know, due to my experience at New Horizons and then my experience at another company called LearnVisualStudio.net, I had been making digital course content even before that was a thing. And I looked at it, I was like, I can do better than this. Mm, mm. So as I was recovering, I put a course out there and it did well. And then I put another course out there and another. And, you know, now, you know, 13 years later, you know, we've kind of developed a full company producing right. digital learning, both for large brands and then also, you know, for licensing through LMS systems, et cetera. And then we have our continue our direct to consumer business, you know, selling things, help people learn tech through mm. our own our own website, through Udemy and through other venues. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just curious from a business owner perspective as well. You uh, that's a classic uh, starting point of, of sort of leveraging another platform's reach and, and mm -hmm. network effect and then pivot and then building something your own, you know, off, off that platform. When did you make that pivot, that switch? You realized, oh, we've got something here we can actually turn into our own. It was, it was very much by accident. I was all in on Udemy and, you know, for a while with a small company, you know, we were seeing, you know, huge amounts of revenue just selling through them. And I was, I was pretty satisfied with that. Right. Um, and then um, the founder of a company called Teachable contacted me. He uh, recently Anka Anka Nagpal. Yeah, yeah. So he, he no, just he just tweeted about this story. Yeah. Um, he, he did he did a tweet storm last week and and mentioned this story. So oh, no he reached out to me. I was I was kind of the one of the top and, and most visible instructors on Udemy, and he was trying to get some people onto the Teachable platform. And he called me and I kind of said, eh, you know, I don't see how that's necessary. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to compete with myself. And he said, look, it, you know, what do I have to do? I want you to try this. I think it's I think it's really going to work for you. Um, so literally he wrote about this. I sent him via postal mail <laughs> a hard drive with 400 or 500 videos on it. I don't remember the number You know, yeah. from from the courses we had at the time. And he spent all weekend uploading them to te to Vimeo and putting them on Teachable for us and building everything out. And we yeah. wound up being his second customer and, and probably the first one that people knew about. So that all of a sudden, you know, when I, a light came on because we weren't splitting the money with you to me, I developed right. a following for our business. Right. And so that quickly kind of matured into a better business for us than you to me. So we started focusing on that. You know, keeping keeping a good relationship with and, and still working with you to me, mm. but you know it really worked. And then that later led to getting into corporate LMS systems, which led to brands using us to create their training. It was mm. all very mm. organic. I'm not sure I had the foresight or smarts to predict any of it. It was just that building an audience led to opportunities that we took advantage mm. of. Yeah. That's crazy. I was hanging out with Ankur uh, in San Diego fairly recently. Um, so that's mm -hmm. that's crazy that he comes into this story. But that's super cool. So um, he's a great you, guy. Yeah, fantastic. Loves loves yeah. a good uh, loves life uh, to the yes. fullest. Um, well, if, I, if I was in this position, I might be loving life to its fullest right now. <laughs> that's also true. That's also true. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So so. So you, you're building this brand. You, you've I, I, I think the part I'm interested in here is you, you, what you saw as the opportunity. You saw this stuff was on there. It was terrible. And I kind of want to like draw out some principles here of like what you think makes really good, you know, video-based online education. 
man, I think it's all about engagement, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I think even though, you know, traditional course structure is always, you know, in this session, we'll be learning about A, B, and surprisingly C. <laughs> I think people know how to consume media now, and we need to yeah. stop telling them how to click the next button and really engage with them as humans. For me, having spent many years in the training room and having taught at the community college level, you know, I'm very good, and, and you know, being a speaker in the industry, I'm very good at engaging people live. Mm. And I think the missing piece of this for most online training is the heart that a teacher brings to that experience and that relationship between the instructor and the learner. And boy, does traditional e-learning suck the life out of <laughs> learning and the joy out of it by reducing yeah. it to a bunch of clicking the next button and disembodied yeah. announcer voices. We hire voiceover people. And I think it comes down to having really good on-screen instructors who you can relate to yeah. And then interact with off of the video to create a learning experience. So I think it's I think it's one I think it's engagement plus community equals yeah. really good digital learning. Um, and 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 by the way, credibility that would be the other thing. Yeah. You know I, I've been I don't know how many things I've seen that you know the initial slide you know destroyed the any credibility that the course had because it looks like something that was from another era. Yeah. You know, my, my joke is, and this is a true story. A few years ago, I went to an e-learning conference and I went to a session on um, graphic design mm -hmm. and the whole session was completely undermined by the quality of the title slide, which was not well designed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's just there's just a book that came out called uh, Graphic Design for Course Creators. I was so excited to get this book um, and I don't want to completely like crap all over the book and the publicly, but I was so excited to get this book because, and I even wrote before I got it, wrote the author and said, boy, this is what this industry needs. You know, as people learning about visual design and getting more, and the book was so poorly laid out that it doesn't have any credibility for graphic design. And yeah. I thought, well, I said, well, at least it's a metaphor for the industry, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's 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 a there's a design element in here as well. I know I want to come back to that, but I just want to go back to the point you made about the heart in the in the in the teacher and that that coming through because there is nothing that inspires people to learn than nothing more than that inspires people to learn than that passion that comes from a teacher. Where you can see they love the material. They are learning all the time themselves, and that's infectious, right? Um, and you and you can't get that across any other way except in video. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, well, I, love that's, that. I mean, I mean, that's because we keep insisting, right, that the subject matter experts don't know how to teach that we but we, we know how to teach. Right. And we suck the life out of the subject matter expert, dehumanize them as part of the process. So we can basically so we can fit it into storyline or some other right. rapid course development tool. Right. Right. And, uh, and and so I actually wanted to ask you about that, because. To be able to scale up, so you, obviously you you create content which is scalable in in, in and of itself. But often those and, and we and we create at scale. I mean, right next to me, this our studio is a mess because we're building out Studio B because we need more capacity than just our yeah. green screen studio. You know, what I mean, yeah, so yeah, we, yeah, yeah. We build a lot a lot of content, and yeah. all of it is teacher centered. It's right. someone on screen in that role as a facilitator. Right. right. But what about uh, for for folks that want to do this? in-house right and and they want to because they have a unique sales process or or a, you know they want to bring their company values into it and they want to kind of get those subject matter experts in front of the camera mm -hmm. i've tried to do that with companies before and it's sometimes exceptionally hard right people are petrified about a camera in front of them um so how, how do you how do you think about that how do you get people to be able to do this well we i mean because we're producing learning and art you know what we tell our partners and people who sell our learning and people who license our stuff is we're providing a broadcast level experience. Right. So we're hiring people who are smart, who are good facilitators, um, who can communicate on camera. So we're really hiring for that with our on camera people before mm. we're hiring for skills. So you got to be a teacher first. Right. Um, you know, when we have 
clients who we're creating learning directly for, you know, we're going to basically still work with their subject matter experts and get them to be as good as they can be on camera um, because we, that's just our model. I don't think anything else works particularly well. Yeah. But so how do you help those people teach? Because I, I, I'll, I, yeah, it's very believe, hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I, but I do believe that teaching, the ability to teach can be taught, right? It can be learned. Yeah. Um, I'm just, I'm just wondering if there's things that you do, like one of the ways that I approach this is to tell them that you've got to like have one clear message in mind, right? That to me is like one of the big mistakes people make is they're just trying to cram everything in to, to yeah. one recording. And it's like, why, you know, just have one right. message we're in teaching, mind. We're teaching too much. And this, this is something, somewhere where instructional designers can be helpful is helping, you know, yeah. subject matter experts kind of pare down what they're trying to teach because over, often it's over ambitious. But I would right. also say too is, you know, communicating on camera is not no longer broadcasting. It's mm. no longer this idea of, you know, I'm communicating to all of you watching. It's about communicating one to one and imagining that you're just showing your friend this skill. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the successful YouTubers, a lot of times they have that skill of communicating one to one and making you feel like you're talking just to them. The idea is bringing kind of like old school radio, bringing that idea of intimacy mm -hmm. back to the discussion. So someone consuming video learning feels like, oh, they're talking to me versus they're talking to a camera or talking to everyone watching the video. So it's really getting them to pare down their communication and use the IU paradigm, mm. um, yeah. you know, and, and, and to demonstrate just like they would demonstrate to me. And I think the sooner you can get them to forget that they're in this really weird environment with a green screen behind them and lights all in their face and just start talking, right. it goes better. And some, sometimes what we do is we'll keep the camera rolling. Yeah, and you get the best and, footage. Yeah, and get some of the best footage because they they, right. they don't realize that you know, right? Totally. You know what, right. what they're doing. So I think that's super helpful advice for anybody. I've definitely seen that work as well, where you just try and and it's hard, like to to. But once someone gets that, that they're just talking to a colleague, you know, behind that camera, it it, it unlocks so much more authenticity and flow in in what yeah. they're saying. I mean, I think too. You know, I mean. We obviously have studios because we're, like I said, producing content at scale. Right. But, you know, getting, if you can set up even, you know, simple cameras, I have an iPhone SC, I don't even have a great iPhone, but yeah. set up simple, you know, cameras, most phones today can capture video that's as good yeah. as, okay. yeah. right. So if you can set it up and light it, you know, put them in their own environment, film them in their own office or their own classroom. Right. You know, and make them as, make it as natural for them as you can yeah. versus in this kind of weird alien studio environment, which feels really strange. And Right. And there's something actually about the last two years of us all being at home and talking to each other on Zoom that's made that more acceptable. Right. It's yeah. actually like it's normal now. Like right. you can see my background. I can see yours. It's just like it's our homes, you know, the repurposed in many ways. And and that's actually I, I think it would be weird to 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 see it not like that. For some people, it's funny. I, you know, I, I, am not a, I, I, I'm a big kind of interpersonal co-location guy, and, and you know, we operate a studio, so our staff, right. you know, have to be here at certain times. But you know, in during the pandemic, of course, I did a lot of meetings and stuff from home, and I didn't realize that you know, in my home office, over my shoulder is my bookshelf. Yeah, and there's a book called "The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark Manson. <laughs> that book was right over my shoulder for months. <laughs> yeah, bright orange cover, mm -hmm. right there as as I was as I was teaching. So I, I'm not sure what kind of message that. Yeah, that making a statement. <laughs> right, exactly. Which you know right. kind of fits in with with my character, but right. you know right. I'm not sure I want to right. make the message quite that overt. <laughs> right, right. But there's there's a good point in that because another thing, this is getting into some of the technicalities, but you can tell a lot of the story with uh, background, with props, basically, right? With yeah. like sets, you you can create sets. Um, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a super interesting point. Um, I think too, you know, I mean, steal from television. I, you know, I. Yeah, we. I. I. I, I watched. It's kind of like once you take a film class, you can never again. 
watch a film without, you know, questioning it. Well, I didn't yeah. think the protagonist was well defined. You know, you right, kind of right. start to, <laughs> I watch TV with this. Like I'm looking at like the graphics and the use of graphics yeah. and you know, yeah, how yeah. they set up. the set. I'm not even sure what the show is about, but I can right. watch the kind of those and then integrate them into our course content or our uh, streaming TV style programming, you know, to, to kind of improve our game. Right. So that's a good segue into um, one thing I was going to ask you about YouTube specifically. I'm a huge fan of, um, so my, my segue into this is going to be Nerd Writer is one of the channels. There's a few around that that do like these incredible video essays breaking down different directors or movies or, or whatever that that done just so much for folks out there. Just um, go out there and, and look at some of those type of things for inspiration. Um, but just to like broaden the question around YouTube, there's... I've been fortunate as well to work with a few of these individuals, people that are essentially educating through YouTube that are amassing mm -hmm. channel followings of, you know, Ali Abdal, uh, who I've worked with quite a bit, is like over 2 million, maybe close to three now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's, a, gonna, he's quite a story, isn't he? It's phenomenal. Yeah, phenomenal. Right? I mean, like a, a medical doctor and just started like putting tutorials of how to pass the, the medical exam on, online. And um, now he talks about productivity and all sorts of things. And yeah, I mean, so and he's, he's actually he's actually stopped pretty much stopped practicing medicine at this point. Yeah. Right? In fact, I th yeah, I think this year he he fully quit. Yeah. Um, going full time creator. So so my question yeah. around that is you you were one of the kind of early creators in that Udemy space. That's the one of the OGs in, in a way. Um, what do you think it is that what, what's the trend? What's the, you know, the, the slipstream that these people are riding um, out there creating content that's educating people? I think so, you know, and I was talking with Mitchell, our, our, our content team lead the other day, and he's of a different generation than I am. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm approaching 50. Mm -hmm. And so I think what appeals to audiences now is wrapping the education in a narrative and in characters that people appreciate. Mm -hmm. You know, while, while we do a lot of straight tutorials, what I really see taking off is something like Ali Abdal, or there's a number of other channels where right. uh, MKBHD, where people Great are fun. learning something, but they're also engrossed in this, like, you know, you know, and Ali Abdal, you know, you see kind of his little circle of friends and, you know, people right. he refers to and kind of, yeah, and, and, and same thing, MKBHD, the staff becomes kind of this little surrogate family who yep. have different personalities and different roles. And I think it's, it's, it's the marriage of what, whether you want to call it, um, reality television or, or level of narrative, which I'm not sure it's completely different, um, mm into education where people are wrapped up into these little educational families. So, you know, our attempt as we launch the the tech learning network is to introduce some of that narrative into into our into our content, yeah. which I think gives people important context for how is stuff used in the real world, you yeah. know, and just a perfect, you know, showing someone how to use all the features of the latest digital television, you know, it can be done as a traditional review or unboxing right. video. step one step two right but then you see someone who brings their you know their teenage kids into it and you know yeah and wraps this kind of narrative around it that people can relate to yeah and i think that's really really interesting and i think it can be done in workplace learning equally equally well right totally. wrapping work stories into this right. we don't do it but I, right. I think that's one of the places that things are going i also think and we see this again and again as media matures quality both in narrative and in production starts to matter more yeah yeah you know i mean if you it, look i mean if, if, if you look at top youtubers and you follow their path product i mean mkbhd being a good example production values matter, matter and yeah. while you can start out you know with your cell phone as you get more mature, as you build an audience, the expectation for your level of production is going to increase. Yeah. So I think people have to learn to be a producer. Yeah, these are both really great insights. I have had that last one, the production value one debate with a lot of people on Twitter before where um, some people say, look, it's all the content. It's just about the content. And Wait, I did agree. you say Twitter? Yeah. I'm buying Twitter. 
Oh, oh, fantastic! You're gonna bid. You're gonna bid. Well, right? I was, I was, I was gonna bid fifty three million, fifty three billion dollars, and then yeah. I realized it's free on the App Store. <laughs> exactly. What's the point? Exactly. Um, yeah, no, it's it's um, that production value debate's an age old one, and and I think it's a yes and debate because yes, the content matters, and people will only come for the content if it's really, really good, and that's all they care about. But you, like you said, as you grow there is there is the need to to sort of follow with that production value hey it's your host andrew here i wanted to take a second just to say that if you're enjoying this podcast we would love it if you did a couple of things for us if you're watching this on youtube please hit that subscribe button it really allows us to grow the channel and reach a lot more people like you if you're listening to this on apple Podcasts, take a moment to leave us a rating and review it's a great way to give us some feedback and to tell the world what you think about this podcast. So whether you listen to it on YouTube or you listen to it as a podcast, if you take one of those actions, it would mean the world to me and my team. Thank you. And with that, right back to the show. Here's something else, too, that, that you know, people don't talk about. But I've had this debate with, you know, with uh, people who are who are well known in the in the learning industry, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and through this through the speaker circuit that, that I'm on. Right. Um, who said, you know, well, studies show that visual design doesn't matter and people can learn from, you know, poorly designed content just as well. And that's become almost an excuse for some not to um, not to create courses with visual design values. Right. Um, and I was having this debate and, and uh, my friend Cammie Bean, who's been a speaker in the industry for years, kind of interrupted and said, beautiful courses matter. Yeah, that's a great and that's a great line. where they matter is credibility. And people say, well, you can learn from you know ugly content. You can learn from poorly designed content. I wonder how many people abandoned that content because the visual design was poor and didn't feel like it had credibility. Yeah. It says it says something about you as the creator, as the you know. It shows that you care, right? Which is then sort of respecting the person that's going to take it. Yes, but I think a lot of people, especially if we go back to kind of corporate learning and the and the L and D side of, of, of what we do, mm. um, just simply don't have the visual design skills. It's one of those like going back to it's yeah. more than one job. Right. Um, right. So they do what they can. There are people who are trying to teach visual design, but really, you know, I mean, visual design, it requires an eye. It requires training yeah. and experience. Right. Um, but also like, you know, there are like, like I could show you 12 things that will improve your visual design 400% and you don't have to know anything else. There's just simple things about alignment and white space that if you yeah. just do these things, it'll yeah. at least be passable. It may not be beautiful. Yeah. But it'll be usable and passable. And, and yeah. it's like even those 12 things, there's like resistance to bringing that level of visual design mm. into instructional design. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, the good news is there are a lot of fantastic tools out there that make this easier and easier, right? And Canva. Uh, Canva, yeah, Figma, which I know is one you talk about a lot. I mean, all like mm. just super, like you can, and Canva's ridiculous. Like my company uses it and it's, insane what we can do in 15 minutes um to create really really good design um i just want to go, before we i'm going to go back to this uh, this the digital skills part of, the, of what you what you guys do but i just want to go back to the point you made about the story as well because it's your production value and story and i think there's good lessons there for people like you said it's it's learnable stuff you can get that production value uh and you can bring the right people in as well and on the story side it's about being intentional. You mentioned Ali Abdal's thing. Uh, he he's super intentional about those. Um, so I, I was I was trying to remember the word he uses. It's like talisman or tokens or artifacts. It's not, it's not those aren't the words, but it's something like that, right? Where he has like a list of them, and he makes sure that every video features one or two of them, right? And so you have these recurring things that keep popping up. Um, it, it's it's like it's that level of intentionality to storytelling that that makes mm -hmm. the stuff really powerful and and I so my question is this the sort of edutainment right like the the role of entertainment in education how important is that to entertain as well as educate I don't like the word edutainment um 
you know, Ray Jimenez, who's been a speaker in industry for years, has been talking about the integration of story into learning for, you know, I I think as long as I've known him. So, you know, 15 Mm. years and, and I'm sure before that in his career. And I mean, it's a very simple point that people remember stories. Mm-hmm. Right. So, I mean, I don't think we necessarily our goal needs to be to entertain, but our goal is to move content from the media, from short term memory into long term memory. Yeah. Story is a tool to do that. Um, yeah. In in the, the new book, uh, Learning Experience Design. Um, mm-hmm. The, I, the, the author's name, who's also kind of a huge industry personality, his name escapes me at the moment. It's really blanking out. Hmm. Uh, Donald. Oh, Donald. Uh, oh, my God. Donald Taylor. No, he, 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 he needs credit. Hold on. Let me see here. Learning experience design book. Um, but he points out that, you know, people do, learning does not have to be fun. Um, Donald Clark. Donald Clark, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so his, his new book, Learning Experience Design, is a fantastic, um, like, kind of high-level primer on the LXD mm-hmm. uh, LXD approach to, to creative learning. And he's, you know, learning doesn't have to be fun, but it also doesn't hurt. Right. And, you know, there may be some people who, on the margins, if they're having fun, will stick around. Right. Where they might not if they so I mean there's there's some value to that but you know also I teach we teach things on the tech side that are pretty dry you know HTML right. not yeah. exactly exciting yeah. so I think that's where that kind of relationship and engagement with the instructor is important yeah. and and also but being I mean being just being someone people can relate to yeah you know I discovered in college I was much better off taking good professors teaching bad subjects than taking bad Bad totally. professors with good subjects because it's what they it's how they're teaching that you're learning from right yeah totally, totally I, I, agree. Think, I, think, I, think, I just think there's this like you know back to basics idea that you know this idea of teachers can be a powerful force in learning yeah and i just i don't know where and and, and i'm not you know, again, I'm not an instructional designer, but I don't know where we lost that idea. Mm. I think it was because we we needed to put everything into like this souped up PowerPoint presentation to fit into the rapid course design software so we could throw it in an LMS, yeah, it's which retro- produced analytics that nobody's ever looked at, right. um, that we forgot about this idea of the teacher and how important yeah. that is. I, mean, I remember every teacher I ever had in school. Yeah. A hundred percent. And that's, that's a big thing I talk about. I mean, you'll, everyone has that, that one or two people that they will, teachers that they've had will never forget. Yeah. And to, I, I believe that everyone is capable of teaching and that truly to make learning within a company work, it, we want to empower everyone to be a teacher and a learner. So the, the best way to learn is from the person sitting next to you doing the same stuff as you one step yeah. behind or one step uh, ahead of you. Um, how do we, yeah, I mean, so, this, this, one, one thing that the industry is talking about that I think we're getting right is that not everything is a course in the LMS. Exactly. Exactly. And that's where learning experience is it's broad enough to, to incorporate right. a lot of these things. Yeah. Um, so, so I'd love to hear your take on, on that idea of everyone's a teacher, everyone's a learner, like enabling people to, and, and this is where I think your expertise in, in video-based education and the digital skills, actually like cloud productivity apps, Figma, all those kind of things. Um, it's it's never been easier to create educational content would you agree yeah which is i mean right which is which is both a blessing and a curse Uh, yeah because we we are (laughs) we're drowning in it now (laughs) and it's of of dubious quality right well i mean you know i mean udemy started as kind of this open platform where anybody could be a teacher and create a course right um the problem is hmm not everybody should right now. <laughs> Agreed. You know, I think, yeah, everybody is equipped to teach. And that might mean, you know, everyone can, you know, pass on tribal knowledge, demonstrate process, help people through mentorship. Right. That's, I mean, that, but not everyone is equipped to produce media Love that, that teaches. Love that distinction because... There are other ways to facilitate that first thing, right? Cohort-based learning is a perfect example, like bringing people together. And then you get that 
that um, dynamic interaction. So yeah, I think that's such a key point. Um, there is a there. I believe I agree with you that there is a sort of role for well produced content. Yeah. To to to. So uh, no, I. I mean, I not, wonder, not 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 everyone can be the host of Jeopardy. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> It's a, and that's a good analogy because it's about holding the space for for people right. to learn and think about things and yeah, um, I I also believe and I'm curious to know if you disagree or disagree here that the purpose of asynchronous content like videos and e-learnings or whatever is to introduce people to ideas that give them concepts, mental models, frameworks to then talk about their actual challenges, their real world challenges with each other. Like that to me is like the main sole, I almost say sole purpose of that type of content. I think, I mean, I relate to that in the technical content that we create, the skills-based content. The idea is to set up a framework for them to be able to go practice and actually learn the skill. Exactly. It, it skill, acquisition, skill acquisition isn't done, you know, by watching a video. Exactly. Skill acquisition is done through practicing the skill. Yeah. So what we need to do is set up a context by which they can practice and acquire the skill, which is why people say, well, video learning doesn't work. Yes, it doesn't work in isolation yes. of supporting content that get people to practice. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that practice and reflect as well, right? Like what that that deliberate that's deliberate practice, basically, right? Like the right. I mean, I think for and I don't like the term soft skills, but I'm gonna say like, you know, non-technical skills that are as much about, you know, uh, heart as they are about intellect. Right. Um, I, I do think that reflection is really important. I don't teach that stuff, but we are we are currently doing a DEI series because our clients are asking for it. Yeah. And we, we've hired, of course, a DEI expert who's coming in to, to who's building that content and hosting the content for us. And. You know, she's constantly talking about reflecting on yes. ideas because that it's not just, you know, you can't practice, um, you know, uh, you can't practice bias. some of the, the yeah, but you, you, you can't practice, you know, building a diverse work, workforce. Right. You can't practice, uh, un, you know, not having unconscious bias. Yeah. It's, it's something that there you've got to move from here to here. Exactly. And that's where that reflection is important. Reflection and then the bringing together of people, because there's there's no, and that's a perfect example for me. There's no better way to truly experience diversity, inclusion and, and equality than being in a group of people with diverse opinions where right. you know, well, I mean, share, you know, and you, you're naturally starting to, you know, the human nature comes in. Uh, on, online, you know, is 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 great for many things, but as online education professionals, you know, still a few thousand of us will be in Orlando next week at Learning Solutions. Right, right. You know, having real life discussions with each right. other. Right, exactly. And and it's both now. Now we can do both. Now we right. can be. It's hybrid. Yeah. Um, I do think. I do think, though. You know, and and yeah. I don't know if you. I, I'd be interested to hear your take on this. I do think that people have discovered they really like working at home. Mm. They like the flexibility. They like the time with family. And I think that's reason enough for us to do it. Mm. But I think the claims of productivity are dubious. Because a lot mm. of it is based on self-reporting. And if you say to someone who's got a job and is now working at home, are you more productive at home? No one is going to say no. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, I look at it from my perspective. It's, it, it's not comparable because I'm running my own business and, you know, I'm working like crazy. So that's, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if I look at my team, everyone is a lot more productive because they get to work on their own hours. There's no commute. It's, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's a lot of things there. That, that flexibility thing is so under... I don't know if it's underrated, but it's not, it's not like teased out enough, like what it actually means. Like to me, there's like a, there's an autonomy that comes from that where the person feels like they own what they're working on. But Andrew, doesn't that go back to though, how you run your business? Cause I think, you know, like for years and, and we talk about this in the industry, you know, the, for some reason metrics were like ass and seat time and, and, you know, yeah, versus rates. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, we're, our, we're, in a, we're, we're an outcomes based organization. I don't care when you go to the dentist or if you go to your, right. you know, your cousin's soccer game or, you know, you take Friday off cause you want to, you know, get a, get a jump on this holiday weekend traffic right. like many people are today. Right. Absolutely. I don't care about any of that. 
did you get your stuff done? Yeah. Was it done on time? Yeah. Was it of an acceptable quality level? Yeah. Those are the three questions I asked. And I don't care what you're wearing, when you're here, when you're working at home. I don't mm -hmm. care if you're working from, from the coffee shop down the street. I think you know, the flexibility is more about employers asking the right questions and measuring the right things mm. versus, you know, how much time did you spend in a seat, regardless that they're spending half that time looking at Facebook or LinkedIn or something. Right. Yeah, totally. No, I, I, I completely agree. I do, I do think it's changing. I think the startups, uh, early stage growth companies, like they are they have embraced this a lot quicker than some of the, the but it's, but I mean, you, you see PwC just recently announced that they're going to let their entire workforce work remotely if, if they want. Right. And it's, gonna... it's, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, I think too, there's a level of elitism to this discussion because there are so many jobs that are very hard jobs that cannot be done. Absolutely. From home. Absolutely. You yeah. know, I think of teachers, nursing, you know, yeah, I, retail. sanitation, I mean, very, very yeah. hard jobs. Yeah. You know, yeah. that, so, I mean, I think there's a certain level of, of kind of elitism that we've got to think about when we have this discussion and remember yeah. people who can't work from home. Yeah. That having been said, I do think, you know, this next generation of startups. Look, I mean, office space is a huge expense, just practically. Totally. You know, give everyone a WeWork membership if you want to have some space where people can meet. Right. You know, I think a WeWork membership now is one hundred ninety nine bucks a month if the company survives. Yeah. You know, <laughs> But, I mean, this idea that, you know, people have to, you know, take a train into the city from the area where you and I live, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, go to a big office building so they can sit in a cubicle by themselves all day yeah. is absurd. Right. But so I do three. think there is a place for being together at times when you want to foster creativity, team yeah. dynamics, etc. I yeah. think there has to be a mixture. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think the... I, the uh, team retreat is going to come back in a big, big way. Yeah. Uh, right. Like the, like all that money that's sort of been saved from office space, from all that sort of stuff, just get invested into an amazing week off site in a foreign location, even like, I, I think that could be a, a huge growth area for the tourism industries, but, and, and a great thing to do for companies. Um, yeah, no, I think it's going to be good for, you know, I think for travel companies that are geared towards group travel and, yeah. and you know, renting spaces and things. I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting, you know, things that could happen there. Right. I, th I do think, though, right now we're still in this transitional period where people are just trying to get their bearings in the 100%. new reality and figure out what it's what it's going to be like. 100 percent. Yeah. Um, this has been so good. Um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to try to pull us back to, to what we were talking about. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you let me go, I'll, I'll talk yeah, yeah. about anything. But, so. but I, I definitely enjoyed that. I'm sure, I'm sure many listening will, will have as well. Um, you talked about new realities. This was on the list of my last questions and I'm going to, I'm going to use that as my dubious segue to the new reality of teaching on TikTok. Uh, you've just started getting into that. Um, I, I'm not. We're experimenting. You're exactly. You're experimenting with it. I'm not necessarily focused on TikTok as a platform that is of interest to corporate learning, but I'm more interested in the format, the the style, the the sort of the way it's packaged. What are you learning from those experiments that you think is relevant to a corporate audience? So let me start with. I think it's interesting that TikTok is largely being dismissed by the corporate learning community, mm -hmm. when Twitter was adapted with so much fervor and motivation that it became misused and abused in so many ways that it was almost ridiculous. Mm -hmm. yeah. But but TikTok, I guess because it's a there's because there's a lot of dancing seems right. to be ignored. <laughs> um do you know Josh Cavalier? Josh Cavalier is a yeah. friend of mine. He talks a lot about video and industry. Yeah. Really, really great guy and um has you know knows Everything there is to know about video learning and someone I look up to hmm. made the point that TikTok, where it kind of fits into the learning lifespan, may be an instructional marketing. Instructional marketing. This that idea mean? that, you know, sometimes we have to convince people that they need to learn something mm, and that hook. it's in, it's the hook that, that it's yeah. important to them. And also, I mean, as someone who survives by actually selling content, yeah, you know, instructional marketing for us is really important. Yeah, 
And you know, if you look at the case of like Miss Excel, who brilliant by yeah. all reports has a huge business that starts on TikTok, right. has a very smart business plan. You know, TikTok. I mean, no one's really learning Excel on TikTok. Right. But the instructional marketing works. So they're realizing um, that there's cool stuff you can do on Excel. Maybe they should start learning about it and then they go and find her right. course. Yeah. I think TikTok is though, I think it's a trend. I think what survives the trend long term, whether or not TikTok as a channel does, yeah. What survives the trend long term is short vertical video. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think that's mobile, that's mobile optimized, basically mobile optimized, yeah. short video. I think that's you know, YouTube has tried to with much less success do their YouTube shorts, shorts thing. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. and I but if I think if you look at the if you look at the content on TikTok, you know, it's easy to dismiss as you know a bunch of thirteen year olds dancing. It, the the material is hugely diverse yeah. and i think there's there's a lot of even brands doing interesting things around instructional marketing with tiktok mm. yeah yeah i think that's uh there's a great takeaway here for people i so it reminds me i was talking to jennifer buchanan so she runs um training for frontline associates at sam's club and she was saying uh -huh. how they've shut down all of their classrooms right then they had those like you know, windowless rooms that people would go to and they'd have to, it was obviously horrible. And luckily the pandemic has accelerated them shutting those down. And she said they issued mobile devices, cell phones to every single person in their frontline, you know, associate workforce. And that's how they deliver their training now. And that's meeting people where they are. And a vertical video is going to do a lot better than something you have to sort of sit down and, you know, figure out like how you're going to watch it. And yeah, that makes so much sense. Yeah, I mean, I look. I, I think it's it's easy to either overcommit to new channels or to dismiss them. And I think you know, if we're going to be, and I talk about this a lot, if we're going to be a profession in online education, we need to one grow with the times, but two approach with caution and grow a body of knowledge about what works and what doesn't, and what different channels are for. Right. Right. I think I mean every every new communication technology that comes, starting with the with with the record player, someone's out there saying it's gonna revolutionize ed education. This changes everything. Yeah. And the fact is most education's done the same way it was done two hundred years ago with the sage on the stage. Right. Right. I think there's a great yeah, there's a great lesson in there to to extrapolate that and learn the this this conversation on TikTok is a perfect example of that takeaway of potentially it's something I can see a lot of our clients, a lot of people out there, I'm sure like, oh, we could do vertical video. Also, by the way, it's super much easier to record video, uh, vertical video, um, have something out there that, and, and have the goal to be only to be just getting someone to take the next step. To, to well, the, only, the only reason that 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 uh, landscape orientation is a standard is because just that's what people were used to from their televisions. Right. Had yeah, televisions that's... built been built, you know, in portrait mode, that's what we would be used to. Right. Exactly. I wonder what messages I just exposed to the world there. <laughs> Nothing. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, yeah, Mark, this has been this has been fantastic. I feel like uh, I need to land this plane now, otherwise we will go in full into the next couple of hours here. Um, so maybe we're going to have to to get you back on the show, but. Um, I, I would love to do it. This discussion has been tremendous fun. It was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I appreciate it. I, I'd love to end off with your um, with learning a little bit more about you. You are going to be launching a streaming video network. Um, yeah, I feel like there's a lot of look, we touched on probably parts of why you're doing that. And yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what that is. It comes back to meeting people where they are. Mm -hmm. So our, our new network uh, is called Tech Learning Network. Mm -hmm. um, and we have techlearningnetwork.com. If people want, they can sign up for a preview now. Mm -hmm. um, and what essentially we're doing is we're bringing education to streaming television, 
and kind of a Netflix style environment. That's so there's cool. a couple things going on. So we are moving towards with a video partner of ours creating a streaming 24-7 tech learning video network where people can go, kind of back back to that kind of edutainment idea that I rejected yeah. earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go and you know, learn tech skills. Our motto is we teach tech. Mm. So if you want to go and become more technical, if you want to become more equipped for the contemporary job market, and by the way, this is not something that's, you know, that only people of my age need to do. I don't know how many college graduates I've met who can't create an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. Um, so if you want to become more technical in, in terms of creating technology and content versus just being a consumer of it, that's what we're about. So we'll be available over the next year on streaming television, but always at techlearningnetwork.com with loads of free content and then some premium paid content for people who want to become certified in things like the basics of web development or digital design mm. or digital productivity. That sounds amazing. I can imagine, I can, I can foresee a lot of learning departments starting to send people to this, to get those skills, right? To, to have that person, that go-to person on the team to, to create high quality content. Yeah. And, and I mean, and we're doing what we know as best practices, right? Which for us is engaging presenters, Mm -hmm. um, supporting materials to move people from simply watching a video to practice so they build skills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and also a community around it where people can share with each other as they grow. I think those are the three keys to, to digital learning. And, you know, if you talk about learning experience design, yeah. you know, we are essentially designing learning experiences that go beyond just the simple consuming videos. Because I yeah. think you can't stop there and really call something a valid learning experience. No, that's you're right. That's one part of that trifecta. And you, you absolutely nailed it. Um, I'm excited to see this. I'm looking forward to the launch on June 6th, I think you said. Uh, we are we will be launching formally on June 6th, but uh, people who sign up at techlearningnetwork.com will be able to get a preview a little earlier than that. Amazing. Cool. We'll include all those links in the show notes. Uh, Mark, thanks so much for this conversation, for, for spending the time. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks again for having me on. Let's do it again. Hello, hello. I hope you enjoyed that episode. It's Andrew again with a quick message. If you'd like to support the show, the best way to do that is to leave us ratings and reviews where you listened. If you're on YouTube, hit the like and subscribe buttons and feel free to leave a comment. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, please take the time to give us a rating and leave a review. Once again, we love hearing from our loyal listeners. If you're listening to this on Spotify, please hit the follow button to make sure that you don't miss new episodes as they come out. And as a reminder, this episode is sponsored by The Learning Culture Experience, a first of its kind cohort-based learning experience for learning professionals, in which you will join a community of 50 other innovative learning professionals designing and developing cohort learning experiences that you can roll out in your company. To find out more about the program and when the next cohort is starting, check out curiouslion.cloud forward slash experience. See you next week for another episode of the Learning Culture Podcast. Thank you for listening.